Let me get the clock up. If you uh, haven't seen Flickio, it's kind of cool. It gives you a little clock. Stays, doesn't lock the screen, so you kind of know what time it is. Hello, San Antonio. We were louder in Austin, just saying. Uh, it's nice to be back. I, I was not here last year, Conflict Con, uh, whatever the heck that was at, but it's nice to be back here again at San Antonio. It's nice to see this move on from Cindy and myself and the other people that used to run the Besides Texas stuff. So um, it's nice. I have time to do more stuff like interesting PowerShell uh, research and write a tool called LogMD. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but mostly this is about PowerShell detection. Uh, how many people here know what version of PowerShell is running in their infrastructure? Oh, wow. Really? Nobody? Well, then you're really going to like this talk. Um, or how about your own PC, except for Fred on a Mac? Well, you, PowerShell now runs on a Mac, so you can even do it on a Mac. So um, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here, is the fact that you don't know is kind of a big gap. I would call this talk or this exploitation or this risk or this uh, vulnerability, well, wait, Windows is a vulnerability, so just Windows in general. <laughs> This is probably the number one concern you have in your environment right now. If you have, how many people here have paid or gotten pen test servicing, red team servicing done at all in their organization? Whether you admit it or not, maybe that's part of the problem. Too many government people won't raise their hands. Dang it. So the red teamers love PowerShell. The bad guys love PowerShell. So that's what this talk's all about, is how can you detect things like PowerShell exploitation? So who am I? I am a blue team defender ninja, I'm our archaeologist, I'm a logaholic. Hello, my name is Michael, I'm a logaholic. Okay, got to make sure you stay awake, it's the end of the day. So that's the way we would. I love properly configured logs because they tell us who, what, where, when, and hopefully how, what happened to your system, okay? And it's really powerful, but unfortunately, Windows in this case, by default, sucks. By default, Microsoft does not enable PowerShell logging with a very small exception. I'm also the creator of some cheat sheets. How many people here have heard of the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet series? Fair amount. So one of them is the PowerShell Windows PowerShell Logging Cheat Sheet. If you're not familiar with that, you really should be after this talk, but it is a series of these things together. Um, I also give examples in the Splunk Logging Cheat Sheet, and we just added our seventh with the Humio Logging Cheat Sheet. Humio, probably nobody in this room has heard of, but it is a competitor of Splunk, fairly new, really good solution. And for all of you that want to log your stuff at home and learn how to do better logging, they have a free solution that holds two terabytes for a week. You can do five systems in your home with all these cheat sheet things enabled. There's a whole bunch of queries I've created for you, and you can monitor your home fully turned on. It's awesome. And it's free. Did I mention it's free? Did I say it was free? And then they have obviously paid solutions as well, but uh, kudos to them. I'm also the co-creator of this uh, you know, billboard I'm wearing called LogMD. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the course of the, the presentation, but uh, focusing on that. I'm also the co-host of Breaking Down Incident Response. Anybody watch Breaking Down Security, watch, listen to Breaking Down Security podcast or, or BDAR? Got a couple people doing BDAR. So we did this podcast solely to help share this kind of information with the public because we really lack things I can take back to work and do when I listen to podcasts. That's what I want when I go to talks, when I go to trainings, when I, go, when I listen to things. I want to be able to take this back. Hey, DEF CON's a great con. Can you do 80% of what you listen to back at work, the thing that pays our checks? Um, and that's what we're trying to focus on is things you can actually do. And we did release uh, version 2 here a little bit back. We're about to release version 2.1. And you'll see a, a sneak peek of that in the course of the present. So what's the challenge? Malware loves PowerShell, uh, mainly to download the payloads. Uh, it it kind of changed dramatically about a year and a half ago. Uh, we hardly saw PowerShell used. And then all of a sudden, everything now is PowerShell. Matter of fact, I, it's rare I don't see malware using PowerShell to pull stuff down. Why? The bad guys can write less code because they're going to use what's already living off the land. They're going to use PowerShell. It's already in the box to make calls to go get their dropper to execute their dropper. So now they can write less code. It's quicker. It's easier. And Microsoft has provided them all of .NET at their disposal with PowerShell. So they have lots of opportunity here. 
Red teamers love this stuff, and you'll see why in a second with as many exploitation kits that uh, are, exist out there. And they love to hide, okay? So that's something we have to uncover. But PowerShell does make noise. You just have to know how to detect it. So where do we start? Check your settings. Now you know why I asked the question at the beginning. How many people here know what version of PowerShell to run? You have to know what version of PowerShell you run because for the love of all that is security, everybody in this room and your organizations need to upgrade to PowerShell 5. You must do so because if you do not, you cannot detect the types of attacks I'm going to talk about today at all well. And if you're using PowerShell v2 profile.ps1, which I recommend in the, in the cheat sheets to turn on, uh, populate with a couple variables, which sets process command line logging to occur in older versions of v2, v3, v4. The problem is all malware that I see always executes a minus nop or minus no profile. So the profile ends up being useless. This is why you need to upgrade to PowerShell 5, one of many reasons. And of course, execution policies. I still see companies that just can't pick one. Well, we turn around where we need to. This is not a security thing. It is a way for you to help detect the bad things in your environment. Because what they do in the course of executing PowerShell, yay Microsoft, they gave us this powerful, powerful tool and some settings, and guess what? You can bypass them all. Yay. Execution policy, bypass, and poof. Whatever your policy is, does not work. So how do I check my systems for this? How do I figure out? How do I audit them? How do I get a report? How do I start the process? You gotta help me. Turns out, free tool called LogMD. We do have a pro version too, I'll, I'll tell you that right now, full disclosure. Um, but what we do when you run it, this is our legal test copy guy, uh, when you run it, the first thing it's gonna tell you when you do a LogMD, which is a default minus one, is we're gonna tell you what the policy of your box is and what version you're running, because it's so important that we get you guys up or at least knowledgeable about the fact you're not running PowerShell v5. And the fact that if you do have v2 on the box, that there's downgrade attacks are possible. Downgrade attacks, there's a couple DLLs, two or three DLLs that actually are PowerShell. System.management.automation.dll and another one. And that is actually PowerShell. It's not PowerShell EXE. That's just a fancy GUI thing that runs the PowerShell. The PowerShell power is in the DLLs. Those things reside in the box. They cannot be removed. They're hooked into the system. You're stuck with them. Too bad for you. Uh, Windows 10 in 2016, there is an option saying disable it. Yeah, all it's doing is turning off the ability to call it from your perspective, but not from the bad guy's perspective. So LogMD will spit this out to you so you now have an idea where you stand. That's the first thing. Also, we give you a report. It's in text, which means for anybody who is a consultant, you can, or I was a consultant for many years, sort of still am, I do consulting, is I want to be able to cut and paste what I need to into a report. So we just make it clear text, you can make it whatever you want. Um, this is an interesting aspect of what this looks like here. What are all those fives? We compare with the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet, uh, is all the recommend, recommended settings that I tell you guys to turn on and everybody who wants to do security well from a logging perspective. And the CIS and USGCBs and Aussie Cyber Standards are also something LogMD checks for. So we check all the audit settings and we say, how are you compared to these standards? And also the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets. And you can see the only thing that's yes is the one with Windows Logging Cheat Sheets. The five indicates these standards that we all use in compliance that we're told to rely on don't even mention enabling PowerShell logging. So they are about five years behind. They're just now discussing putting this into their benchmarks and, and standards. Uh, documents are just starting to come out from the government side. And that's a flaw because so many pen testers use this. The hackers are heavily using this. If you talk to somebody who's been owned at a targeted attack, they will tell you they predominantly see PowerShell being used. So that is the bummer. So now we got this nice report. You now have action to go and help and put in tickets and do what you need to do and get PowerShell enabled. You have what you need to audit. The next thing you have to do is enable the logging. Of course, there's this thing called a Windows PowerShell logging cheat sheet. Who thought? Um, and this will tell you what to turn on, okay? They're all GPO. There's only about four settings you really have to worry about. You have to upgrade to version five of PowerShell for this to be at all useful. And yes, use the profile, which again, a minus not will bypass. Um, but the cheat sheets are there to guide you. So now you have a standard to take to work saying, we fail here, I wanna get to here, and you're about to see why. And yes, thank you Microsoft for having all these bypasses. Um, I got this off of actually an article a guy wrote, I worked with Event Sentry on some PowerShell stuff, and they published this. This, this uh, table comes from something else, but they, they threw this together and I thought, hey, this is actually pretty good. Because it does list uh, the Windows, there's actually two PowerShell logs, by the way. The Windows PowerShell log event IDs, 
And again, for reference, please download this and really consume and study this. And then also the PowerShell operational event IDs. There are two we did not list. Nobody in the right mind would enable these except your pen testers and attackers. That would generate so much noise. If I wanted to hide my activity, I would enable these, kick off a script, completely flush your logs by rotating them out in a matter of minutes with 4105 and 4106s. So these are very bad, but worth mentioning. That's what they'd be used for. Just talk to any, any red teamer. If they don't know about this, uh, this attack or way to flood the logs, then uh, hire somebody else. Typical malware, lots of PowerShell. Almost every download I see now comes, and comes from PowerShell. WinWord calls command shell, calls W script, calls C script, doesn't matter, and eventually PowerShell will go out and fetch it because built into PowerShell is the ability of doing web calls. And again, most malware we see it. I'm hearing it more and more in the targeted attacks. You read the reports from the uh, IR firms, you're gonna see that they're gonna reference PowerShell's use, PowerShell use. The pen testers and talks you hear about living off the land. That's what we're talking about. What can we use that's already on the system? All right, the whitelisting application bypass uh, exploits that Casey talks about all the time are things that I can run on Windows that are trusted because they're Microsoft signed that can go out to the internet and download stuff and then I don't have to actually use malware or write something. I can just live off the land. Pen testers love this stuff. And again, there are tons of post-exploitation post kits. I'm here to tell you that the empire has fallen. You can detect these if you pay attention to this presentation. There are lots of them out there. The red teamers love this stuff. Here's your proof. They've written so many exploit kits, post-exploit kits. And I don't even think I put Metasploit on here, but nevertheless, Metasploit's included. So blue team, baby. I think it's the most sexiest thing you could ever do as a job. People say, oh, red team's sexy when I pop a box. No, you know what's sexy? Me kicking the Chinese out of my environment. That's the biggest thrill I've ever gotten in my security career, period. So if you want sexy, kick out a bad advisor, an adversary. 4688s, these are process creates. Again, thank you or F you Microsoft for not enabling this by default. This watches on your system the things that execute as they occur. But again, off by default, you must enable them, follow the Windows logging cheat sheet. This is an example of logmd output. And what you're seeing here is WinWord, a WinWord document at the top, calling, again, parent-child relationship, calling command shell, which then spawns PowerShell, which phones home. You can't understand what's up there. We'll get to that as we, as we progress. Then downloads the malware, launches two versions of it. Why? Because a lot of EDR says, you want to kill that process that's evil? Yes, I do. I just cleaned the box. No, the other one's going to start it back up. They have a check and balance. They understand load balancing, DR, and BCP in malware. So yeah, uh, they launched two copies of their malware. Very, very common. And you can see down here, basically Word ca calling power, command.exe calling PowerShell, which gets the droppers, launches the malware, and the malware launches another copy of itself to protect itself. This is actually what that blurb looks like. Uh, anybody think that's normal? Okay. So the goal here is to figure out what's not normal and make it stick out more. Okay. And there's many ways we can do that. One of which is the fact that it's so friggin' large. Okay. But there's a lot of large normal, but it won't look like this. So let's look at that a little bit tighter. I got rid of 42 of the lines of all that garbage, and now what we see is the top and the bottom. And we can start seeing things that are obvious to us. There's a bunch of gobbledygook. There's some convert, secure, string, etc. There's some com specs, so we know they're doing some variables uh, with all these sets and the percentages. So we have an idea they're doing something with a bunch of variables. Uh, basically, they're obfuscating. They're trying to hide what they're doing. Did that look normal to anybody? Unless you're the evil guy, and if you are, then I'm teaching you how to be more evil because I'm teaching you how to catch yourself. But anyway, the 4688 process execution is the core of Windows. Anything that executes a Windows, that log in the security log will catch anything that executes almost anything. There are ways to execute stuff without logging stuff. But for the most part, this is how it works. And you can catch this just by enabling process command line, or uh, process create, with the addition, you should enable the process command line stuff as well, because that's where all that foo we just saw occurs, is in the command line. But I might catch passwords, and we'll talk about that. So again, anytime you see word calling command, C script, W script, anything after that, flag it. This is how most EDRs will flag that a malicious document's being loaded, whether it's Word, Excel, or anything else. And so that big blob looks interesting, so let's dig into that. So the PowerShell bypasses, I talked about this at the beginning, right? The minus not. So what you see here is this window's hidden. Why? The bad guys don't want you to see the 
the PowerShell window that pops up, great, Microsoft gives you a minus H. They do it for the admins, so the admins don't interrupt what you're doing, but the hackers love it as well and use it pretty extensively. Also here, here's the minus NOP. That means the profile that I tell you to set the variables in to do the process command line logging in PowerShell v2 will no longer work because they're bypassing your profile. And it's not interactive, and it's hidden, and there's all that other garbage. So the buzzwords of the things that make it look like it's being uh, bypassed are things you should look for. Here's a Humio uh, logging solution that has it. And you can see here PowerShell non-interactive. Notice the uh, scenario of uppercase and lowercase. Now they do that because a lot of email scanners being Linux based and whatnot, case matters. Windows, it does not matter. Logging, it does not matter. But in the course of the, of the message being inspected, case does matter. So they do this, which, for, which is almost funny to me because in the Windows environment, this is really useless. But nevertheless, it makes it stick out more, so yay. Uh, execution policy bypass. Don't matter what you're set to, they're bypassing it. And they're using a hidden window so you don't see it. Right there. So they do this to hide what they see, right? You can capture this behavior in a 4688, standard procedure of word calling command shell, calling PowerShell, whatever they execute with PowerShell in the initial call will be collected on that command line. But you must enable process command line. It's another option in GPL you must turn on. You will get some flack for it. Ah, you'll catch my domain admin creds. Good. If you're stupid enough to type your, your domain admin credential password in a script or store it in a script, that means you're violating uh, policy because you are storing a password in clear on the disk that sit there all the time that I can find if I just scan for any kind of text file. There's other ways you can pipe it. There's solutions you can pipe it. But if I find it in the logs, you can remediate it. If you get to a point where I can't remediate it, it's something really weird and custom, fine. I can tell the log management solution, this combo of things don't send to log management, and then I can't see it. And you'll identify the fact that it still occurs. That box should be isolated because the admin creds are in the clear on that box. So I don't have a problem finding passwords, and I've rarely seen this. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've come across more passwords in username fields in the logs than I've ever seen in a command line process. And again, the bypassing with the V2 stuff, this is why V2 is so worthless now. The bad guys have figured out everything to do. Even our puppets and chefs and chocolates and bamboos, by default, I actually chewed out one of the bamboo guys because they execute the stuff with a minus execution policy. So he started setting off when they deployed bamboo. They started setting off my alarm that said, anytime you see the word minus bypass, throw an alarm. And I'm, I, the guy's like, the vendor gave us a script. So we had to call the, the third party vendor through Atlassian and say, hey, what the hell are you doing? And they, they said, well, we do that so nobody has to change a configuration. You know this is a complete violation, right? And this is why. They changed their product for us and gave us one that didn't do that. And so these are the conversations you have to have. Don't allow good tools to execute stupid things that the hackers do because you'll end up excluding the, the good stuff and also exclude the bad stuff. So yay for Microsoft to, to build in the uh, bypasses. And there's lots of ways to spell the bypasses. That's what's worse. You don't have to do the whole word no profile. NOP will work. No PR will work. No PRO will work. PowerShell has that autofill capability, which makes it really hard to look for words. But we can deal with that. PowerShell logs in, in version 2 and 5, you get these lower numbers. So the lower numbers means it's in a Windows PowerShell log, which is off the roots of application and services. And underneath Microsoft Windows, below that will be the PowerShell operational logs, which has the larger numbers. And so the 400s and 600s are something you should definitely look at. The 500s are around with V2 as well. They'll give you the process command line, but again, the, NOP, the minus NOP will bypass that. Um, but it's worth looking at. The 4s, 6s, and 8s are something you should collect and should focus on. And there's a lot of duplicates, okay? Because every time a part of a script executes, there's a scriptlet and a script and a command and a prompt. And so you'll get four entries or six, it's generally six entries for the same thing. So you have to learn how to dedupe that information, as we call it in Splunk. So web calls. Well, what does a web call look like in a 4688? Well, they look like that. New object system dot net dot web client dot download string blah, 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 right? And then HTTP. Now, if they're in the clear, then the buzzwords that I mentioned right here will work. You can set up an alert that says, when I see this string or these strings, send me an alert. PowerShell's downloading something. That's not normal. 
And if your admin's doing it that way, you'll need to figure out exactly what, where, and why, and, and where he's doing it, and then set a rule up that says, okay, don't detect it when this system by this user is doing this string set, okay? And then you can say, throw that out because then everything else is bad. But the problem is there's lots of ways to spell these, like encode or encoded, okay? So you can't just look for the word .NET, .Web client, okay? Um, but there are obfuscations of that. And here's an example where they use an encoded command. And again, there's the encoding. And so what does this mean? Is this good or bad? The fact that it's encoded is bad. And if you follow the parent tree of something like, again, command shell's calling it from Word, you know it's bad. But they're doing this in order to try to get past the, the defenses, the things that you might see. To me, the minute I see that, I'm like, A, uppercase, lowercase, and a blurb. Are admins, anybody's admins do this? Anybody? No, they just don't. So fetch, that's what they're doing. They're basically going out and fetching uh, the item. Here's an example of a fetch. Same thing I just showed you, but now they've obfuscated it. Yay, PowerShell lets you put ticks and carrots in, in the middle of the words, and they ignore them. So now, if I want to look for a web client, guess what? I can't. Damn it. Now what do I do? Well, you look for the obfuscation, right? So here it is there, and here it is there. Same thing but in two different ways. And there it is again, some more information. And there it is again, more information. You can see the download screen. So what we want is the ability to take this and turn it into this. Anybody care to guess how I did this? Here's a thought. I regex out all the special characters and then I rewrite it. Now I don't have, now I can pass the, right? So lots of ways we can do this in logs. So base64 and code, that's what we saw. Now one of the things that base64 does is often puts an equal or two equals into the code. There's another example where you see two equals. But if you do the, if you do the four bytes correctly, there'll be no equal. So you can't just say, well, I'll look for anything that has a bunch of characters and an equal. There is base64 that will not end in an equal. Um, but the fact that it's large is an indicator. And base64 is what? A through Z, capital A through capital Z, zero through nine. Okay, all the other characters do not matter, count those, and now suddenly I can trigger on the detection of this. You can also take that big blurb right there, go to a site and say, hey, please translate that, right? This is kind of how you do it manually. But you don't need to, because in PowerShell v5, there's a 4104 called module logging, and guess what it does? It translates that base64 into what we can read. So the translation occurs automatically in the logs, and yes, you have to enable module logging. It's one of the settings in the cheat sheet. And now suddenly I can see things that are odd. I can see that, you know, kill PowerShell. So when I launched this thing, did your, power, did your Excel die? Yes, and guess what? It went out and saw that, downloaded that malware. Suddenly now I can read it because the, de the decode occurred when it actually got written to the log. So thank you, Microsoft. And you can see down here I now read that the fact that web client is going on. So very cool. So the fact that it decodes it now means I can take a blurb that I can't understand and I can now suddenly, whoops, I can now suddenly read it. That's the cool part. So this is why 4104s are so important and why PowerShell 5 is so important. Stuff that they're trying to do and get by suddenly now is decoded in your logs and you don't have to do anything other than enable it. So let's look at that base64 blob. Here's an example of one that has two equal signs, right? Big ass blob, what does it do? Uh, here's an example of a Humio output where I'm actually counting the base64 block. So I have an alert that says if you are A through Z, A through Z, 0 through 9, and you're above 50, 60, 100, 200, I think I got it set around 500 uh, characters, then take that block, call it block, and then I go look at the 4104 message and I can now see what the heck it does. And they're still trying to obfuscate stuff. There's some combination of IP address in here probably. Um, and you can see now we got uh, system.management.automation PS credentials. So we now knew they're doing, they're doing creds. This is probably something to do with the cred and then convert to secure string, et cetera, et cetera, right? Suddenly now we can see stuff. So this is Humio. Bam. That's what we're after right there. So 4688s and 4104s. 4688s won't decode anything. The 4104 will show you the PowerShell decode, decoding. And then the 400s are in the older version of PowerShell, but used in the newer, newer ones as well. So let's look at obfuscation and what we can see in those. You soften the big blurps. A, if it's base64, it's a big blurb. There's nothing special other than the size and the lack of other characters in it and the way they call it, but that can be obfuscated. The obfuscation are the use of these funny characters, including carrots and ticks and pluses, 
right? They'll take this and this and they'll put this together and they'll make up the word PowerShell so that you can't use the buzzword checks. You know, my trigger for, for, for minus not, minus no profile, minus EXP, minus execution policy, they're not working because they keep putting ticks in there. And that's the idea, that's what they're trying to break. And they use dollars and percentages for variables and whatnot. So what you're focusing here on is the odd characters. Surprisingly, um, it's not that bad. Uh, it, it's, there's all the things they can do. If you really want to see what can be done with obfuscation, go watch Daniel Bahannon's talk on PowerShell obfuscation. And you can thank him for this stuff. Actually, you should probably refer to him as this uh, because of the fact that that's how he's trying to teach you how to write PowerShell ponage. But the fact that you're doing this is very detectable. Because what happens if I start counting those characters? Suddenly, this code on the left, which clearly looks funky to me, I can now take out all the special characters. Remember when I said I stripped it out and then I reposted it? That's how I got the difference of obfuscated and not. Now the, my buzzword checks will work. I strip out all the known characters, so now the stuff gets crammed together unless they've uh, done some other rearranging and things. And I count it. Look, there's 138 ticks and 264 pluses. I defy you to find a legitimate PowerShell usage that does that. And this is how you can catch those kinds of scenarios. I cannot read it, but I definitely can see there's ticks in it, so there's something more to do. And it's very, very telling once you isolate that. So here's an example of one as well. This is normal. I can read this data, and inside the data are the typical backslashes and things you can see. Now this is actually, you can read all this, right? So users hack me app data, so lots of backslashes, a few parents, and so now suddenly you can see the makeup between what a normal scenario count looks like right, 22 and three, and the makeup of it, and what bad looks like. Big, huge difference, very obvious. So in your log management solutions, a little bit of regex, you can detect this very easily. And you can do that with all of them, 4688s, because they'll put the ticks in there, the 4104s like the last slide, and also the 400, so it depends what version of PowerShell. Same example, whoops, same example as the last one, same thing, low tick count in a 400 event. And you should look at all of these because they all do something slightly different in, in PowerShell. So script block logging. PowerShell is broken up in these blocks of, of script. You'll see 1 of 6, 2 of 6, 3 of 6, 4 of 6, etc. And in those they do different functions. This is how you'll see your bamboos and your chocolates and all those work. Right? Big, long ass scripts that get broken up based by functions. But the cool thing is it tells you right at the top of the thing, hey I'm a script block and I'm, I am one of, in this case 101, here's my my script for turning on uh, file auditing in PowerShell. And, and so it tells you, it gives you an indication this is going on, okay? And in this case, it's a verbose log. It's, it's not a warning or anything else. But the cool thing is, when they do trigger these script blocks, they're big, okay? Now, if I saw this just from looking at that data, but this isn't very useful to me because of the fact it's so big. If you output this to Excel, your, your, your row is going to be this tall. It's really hard to, to manipulate. So what you have to do is say, what can I look at? Well, if you look right here, I'm counting the command length. So now I have a trigger about how long. I have an obfuscation to count how many pluses, ticks, and everything else. So the combination of all these events, I got a big block. It violates the counts that I'm looking for. They exceed 550, 100, 200, et cetera. I suddenly can not only look at a big script block in the size, I have a secondary mechanism that says, and it's obfuscated, trying to do something funky, okay? And so that's the cool thing. I would say start at about 1,000. You will get false positives, real, real stuff that executes in very large blocks like a bamboo, chocolate, et cetera, um, but that's okay. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is one of those normal big blocks. This is big, but guess what? I can actually read that, but, I don't know if it's being used for good or for bad. That's the problem with the hackers. The pen testers will do this. The hackers will also do this. They can use the real normal, I'm just going to query the system like for inventory. So I wouldn't be able to tell if this is an inventory script or whether the bad guy is trying to inventory our system because he just wrote a PowerShell script or pulled the one down from the internet that does an inventory that someone wrote and just executed in your system. But it's bad or it's being used for bad, but it's big, but it looks normal. So we have to figure out what the combination, in this case, this one is 9,553 large, pretty big. The big difference is that one's readable, that one is not. So suddenly large size means it's readable or not and this one has ticks, right? So we know we can identify that. 
So now we have to determine how do we separate readable good script blocks from readable bad script blocks. Well, they'll obfuscate it like I just showed you in the last one. 138 tick counts, 264 pluses. Boom, here's all this code. You can see down here there's some normal ones. That's bad. These two little short guys are good, small counts. So now you can see all three of these examples I've shown thus far together. What do, you, do you think that would stick out to you in an alert? Do you think that would be something to, to focus on there? Definitely. Module logging. Uh, this is cool because in module logging, when you execute something in PowerShell that violates a built-in PowerShell rule, and, and I've been doing logging a long time. I generally tell people that the level of the log, just ignore it. It, it rarely is an indicator of anything. Except in PowerShell, Microsoft at least says, hey, there's a violation that's executed. Yeah, I, I think I can figure out the violation. <laughs> it's all that crap, right? And so pay attention to the fact that in these event logs, there are warnings in a couple of event IDs, and they will help direct you another item you can focus on to say, this is potentially bad PowerShell. I got a warning. Does it have a large tick count? Yes. Does it have a large block count? Yes. Does it have... Base 64, no, let's look at it. Let's see what it's going to do. So thank you for that. Finally, a warning that's worthwhile in Windows. And this is what actually triggered a warning on. So there you can see it right at the top. Bink, right there. Warning. And here's that bad loop of script. So now we're starting to put all the pieces together. Look for warnings, large blocks, obfuscation, etc. This is definitely bad. This does not look normal. No way, no how. And so here's what it looks like in the actual event log itself. You can see the word warning. And so in Splunk, you would basically say level equals warning. You know, event ID 4104, bam, give me a table of the output. And then you have an idea of what's going on, OK? And there's the actual backend data. Warning, warning. So warning, what do you know? Actually, something you can use. And you can also see translations in the PowerShell operational log for the event ID 4100. It will take some of that data, again, a violation of a PowerShell rule that Microsoft says, we're executed this, but there's something not right about it. Now, unfortunately, they don't tell you what the violation is. But suddenly you can, and you're right here, missing, closing, in expression. There's some, there's some data in here, but it doesn't help. Just a warning. But this thing did execute. It did, the box definitely got infected, right? But it translated some of the stuff that executed in the course of that big blurps of pluses. You know, all blah, 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 plus, 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 boom. And it's trying to give you an indication of what happened in that big, large script block. So again, a warning in the 4100s, good. Warnings in 4104s, good for us detectors, not for the bad guys. And here's a case of what it looks like inside the log. So there's the 4100. There's the big blurb of data. And it will tell you that invoke expression occurred. You can see the IEX right there. That's the short way of doing it, because there's many ways to spell it. And it also gives you the username. That's another cool thing. Uh, there's two usernames, right? The username of the box versus the username of what's executing. And you can see that in one of the other identities. And so the 4100s in Splunk, here's an example of them. Again, I'm looking specifically for warnings. And suddenly now you can see, I can read this down here, but I see that up here. So I can start comparing things, make them stick out to me. Okay? So we're starting to see some false positives. We've got to deal with that. Warning, warning, warning. I can read that. I do not read that. PowerShell 500 events. The 200s, 400s, 500s, 600s, 800s have a lot of overlap. The overlap generally is host application right here. Now, if you do the profile PS1 and you actually, uh, and you actually don't get the minus knob, you will collect a command line execution in the 500 event. That's only if they don't do a minus knob. And so suddenly now we have a base 64. You can see the two equals here at the end. Um, it won't translate anything. Okay, that's what you get. Um, but hey, you did see right here, PowerShell name, right? Kill Excel. So you saw that from the prior event. So it knows at least enough that kill PowerShell was executed after the encoding was done to trigger this for you. But unfortunately, it's in the older logs. It's not a warning. It's just informational. Um, but again, you can use it because it is a big blob. You can count it. You can look at the fact that it's base 64 and start building your queries and triggers off of it. Okay. And yeah, here's an example of two but they don't have to have two, one, or they can have zero. So the 200 events also, again, very repetitive. See, host application, same thing. Here's the big blurb I'm interested in. Here's all the J's, H's, and D's, and whatnot. And again, but this cool thing gives us a warning. So similar to 500, but the 200 gives you a warning. 
We call the, this is called the command help. Is, it, is, is command healthy? Did it execute correctly? And then, of course, uh, the answer is no. It'll give you some translations in here. There's an error. Boom. Warning. Warning, Roy Robinson. Something to look at. Post application. Blah, 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 blah. Get something. PowerShell IEX. Anytime I see PowerShell IEX, I worry. So we have a lot of this stuff. All right? You can detect stuff now. You can see the things and the behaviors that they're using. Pretty typical. Now, we saw some false positives. So how about whitelisting PowerShell on the logs? Okay, that's one of the things we're gonna have to do. So here's an example. What the heck is this? Is this good or is this bad? I can read it, I can totally figure out what the hell the PowerShell is trying to do, but is it being used for good or for bad? Well, if we look a little deeper or further down the, the script, we'll see that this is something chocolatey kicked off. Ah, suddenly now I have something that I can focus on to exclude, okay? That means now when this executes, if I say, you know, ignore anything that specifically comes from this chocolatey directory, not the greatest way to do it, or specifically what is said in here in some aspect, some string, um, I would call these create comments in your code or ask the guys to go add some comments to that. You're not gonna break the PowerShell scripts, but add some comments in there so the comments show up in all the script blocks, like this is not the script you're looking for, right? Pound, pound, pound. Then I can put that in Splunk and say, not, this is the script you're looking for, pound, pound, pound. And now when I run my queries, anything with that in it will drop out. The bad guys will never know this. And suddenly now the good noise can start being filtered out. And you can do it however you can, by, by text, by path, anything you can come up with. Try not to do it by the actual command because the bad guys can use the same good PowerShell commands for checking your system as the inventory software will do as well. So please, get them to sign in some way, form, or manner. Of course, you can actually sign your scripts, but generally that's not gonna happen. People aren't gonna do that too often. Um, we're looking more for buzzwords in there that we can use to exclude from log management to make it easier to filter out the known good so the bad filters out. And actually, if you do a good job at this, no matter what you're using, the bamboo and all that other stuff, you'll actually be able to baseline your, log, your stuff in Splunk to the point where nothing lights up until somebody installs something new, some new module that they add to Bamboo or whatnot, and then it will trigger. And then I have to go chase that down, figure out, tell the guy, can you put a couple comments on like the 38th line so I get it in the second script block and I can filter that out? Sure, he adds a couple comments, I run it again, poof, it's gone because he used the bud words I told him. And that's what you're, you're looking at that as like a secret key or a code. Just real quick, sorry yep. to interrupt guys, if you guys have uh, your windows down in your vehicles, it is pouring outside, so. Social engineer your car, <laughs> make it rain. So the path is awesome because a lot of utilities are scripts that guys write will put a path in there. So if you do see this, have them execute the stuff from a specific path. In gaming, that's exactly what we did. We had a path that we created and said, put your stuff here. And then we excluded by that path and by the name of the script. And that's how we threw out a lot of the good PowerShell that the gamers that the game developers were using. Um, again, secret code would be even better because if the bad guys figure out that the path exists, they might drop their script from there and you might accidentally filter it out because they've listened to this talk because it's actually online. Thank you, Iron Geek. And so that's a, a trend that they'll look at. Oh, let's go look for PowerShell scripts and then put our st bad stuff in the directories we see other PowerShell scripts script because Mike said it, they'll filter that out with Splunk and then they won't see it. So you see the logic why scripts, uh, putting them in the directory of scripts is bad. You want a secret code or some sort of key. And literally, it's just comments added to the PowerShell code. It's not gonna break anything. Or of course, sign your stuff. Once you create these queries, you can trigger on the PowerShell launching. So all that stuff I just showed you, here's my alerts for the inbox that I have for these items. All right? of course, you gotta tweak out the known goods like we just talked about. So here's a ID 400, right? Splunk, PowerShell obfuscation ticks. So I'm counting the special characters. I just call it ticks, but it has a bunch of other special characters in there. So it triggered an ID 400. I've got a bad IP DHV wireless. So that means in this case, I've added the IP to a bad IP list and that I know this PowerShell's talking to and it triggered for that, right? Because I'm checking the firewall logs for the visiting of clients to that IP. And then PowerShell PS web call. So we did a 4688. It saw a web.client, it was in the clear. I can tell that because it's in a 4688. Uh, obfuscation in a 4688, so I can see this all the process command line. That means I know I'm, I'm seeing that. I'm gonna get replication. There's a bypass, which means I did the minus not. So this is a V2 box. 
I now know that, the, that that's not going to work. I'm not going to see any uh, 500 events with, with command line. I can see the web call again with the 400. And then I can see, again, a bypass of the 4688. So suddenly now, something that's normally noisy just triggered like crazy. Okay, and this is actually what you're trying to do and accomplish. This, is, this makes, these are good alerts. That box is owned, without a doubt. And there's all the items. Log goodness. So enable the logs per the cheat sheets. PSV2, even if you have PSV5, uh, PSV5, is still on the box. You cannot get rid of it. So here's my suggestion. I will be adding this to the uh, file auditing cheat sheet. I finally got the information from Lee Holmes about the DLLs I should monitor. And so the, the recommendation here is, how do, I, how do I check to see if someone's using uh, PowerShell v2 attacks, uh, downgrade attacks? You set file auditing on the two DLLs. And then that way, when they call them, there'll be a read. And normally, the system should not be using them because you're on PowerShell v5. And so this is a way for you to ch check on the downgrade attack. And so that's an option, right? So I'm going to add that to the, to the uh, file auditing and, and PowerShell uh, uh, cheat sheets for you. Uh, I haven't got around to doing it because I've been doing a lot of cons the last month. Um, collect the items in the PowerShell v2 logs, 200s, 400s, 500s, and 800s. You will get a lot of replication. We call it deduping and Splunk. But basically, if you see a lot of duplications, you can get rid of them and, and then narrow it down. I'll, I'll show you how we do it with LogMD in a second. Um, and, and that's the Windows PowerShell log, right? So that's under Application Services, Windows PowerShell. It's way at the bottom. In the PowerShell v5 logs, you want to collect the 4100s and 4104s. 4103s are, are somewhat useful as well. There's some information there that's useful. And they are the Win Microsoft Windows PowerShell operational. So it's another layer down in the logs. And then the Windows logs, you definitely want to collect the 4688s with the process command line. So this is the list of things you really want to focus on. I would say start here. And the security log, the 4688s, you're going to see process executed. Hey, PowerShell launched, or command.exe, or Word, command, and PowerShell launched, like you saw in the LogMD example at the very beginning. You're going to see a bypass executed, minus not, minus execution policy, minus bypass. You're going to see some suspicious buzzwords, web client, download, HTTP. Unless they obfuscate it, then you'll start counting and seeing ticks. So you can see how building all this together will kind of overlap. Well, I'm going to get around there. They're, they're looking for the buzzwords by obfuscating it. Yeah, but I'm counting the ticks, so screw you, and I'm going to strip those out, and then I'm going to do a buzzword check. <laughs> Bam, gotcha. Okay, so we can, we can definitely go after them. And you're going to go after all these weird characters. Um, and then, of course, we're going to look for large script blocks because sometimes they'll just make huge blocks. Where else will they put large script blocks or PowerShell code? Somebody? Anybody? There's a big database on a Windows box called the registry. So suddenly now large reg keys become something I can look for because if they hide scripts, which they do, in the registry, because it's just a database, like SharePoint, they're just going to attach a file to it, and then they'll call the key, read the key, drop the stuff, and execute it. Or worse, if they're really good, they're going to call the DLLs that they downloaded from their Windows box, and they'll inject them into memory, and they'll never touch the ones on the disk and do that attack. But that's more complicated. And they're still executing something on the box that you can detect. Okay? So now we can look for these large script blocks and the base64 as well. So we can look for all these indicators together, and you saw what my email alert looked like. In PowerShell v2, uh, command health, the 200s, the life, engine life cycles 400s, and the command life cycle 500s. And again, the minus NOP is not your best friend if you're doing that. That's why please upgrade to PowerShell v5. And oh, by the way, there's PowerShell v6. And the command is now pwsh.exe. And it's under program files, not under Windows System 32, Windows PowerShell v1.0, blah. Right? So now Microsoft has put it in two places and changed the items. So be sure not to forget about your friend, PowerShell v6, with pwsh.exe. PowerShell v2, uh, look for the 200s and 400s. You want to look for web calls. You want to look for obfuscation characters, power. Uh, Script block size of greater than 1,000, of course, the base 64 blocks, and of course, warning. Warning, something's fishy about this script. And in PowerShell v5, you want to look at the 4100s and 4103. These are the execution pipelines. They will trigger a warning. If there's anything in these that's a warning, focus on those. And then look at the size and the ticks and the counts and all that stuff. Okay? And again, no obfuscation here. They've stripped it out and they've translated it 
in, in some aspects. Some of it will still be in there, but a lot of the, 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 that massive plus you saw will actually be translated, especially in Base 64. It's now completely readable. They, it decodes it in a 4104 event. Very awesome. Also in a 4100 and 4104, you can do the web calls, the suspicious, suspicious command, buzzwords, again, because maybe it was obfuscated in a 4688, now that it's deobfuscated or encoded, now it's decoded, and now suddenly I can do my buzzword searches and I can look for web client now to see if there was a download, so yay. And I can obviously look for large counts and everything else, by 64, and again, the warnings do matter here. So very detectable. And then there's a funny little 800, um, not, much, not much talked about. It is used, it is inconsistent, but I finally figured out how to trigger it all the time. I will make an update to the PowerShell logging cheat sheet. There's actually another module name uh, entry you have to add with an asterisk, asterisk, splat, splat, global, global, um, in order to tell it to register all modules. And so you can actually pick what modules you want to register, but you really want to do them all. It's not that noisy. Uh, that has to be set for the 800 to be consistently logging. Um, fairly new find for me. Um, and again, you're focusing on host application. That's where the big blurps will occur in all these all these zero zero events. Sysmon, anybody heard of Sysmon? So Sysmon gives you the added feature. Uh, my internet son, Ben Ten. Anybody know who Ben Ten is? Uh, he, he had to be there to understand the joke, but uh, people actually think he's my son, and we're just going with it uh, after some jokes and Twitter and whatnot. But there's an idea, ID7 in Sysmon. I tell people, do not rely on Sysmon. Oh, I use Sysmon for everything. Yeah, I'm going to own you to Sunday. If you don't believe me, go watch Carlos Perez's talk on the subject, and he'll tell you how you can get by uh, Sysmon, because he'll just change your register keys and tell Sysmon not to collect certain things, and Sysmon will not record that occurred. I can also just add something to the bottom of your config, reload it, and it'll bork the config, because it requires a config to log anything, and if I bork your config, you're not logging anything. So I don't like Sysmon for all the things, but it's good for these things. ID7 is module loading. So what you're going to see now is DLLs. So when malware.exe or funky ben10.exe executes and he makes a call and loads system.management.dll, you know, management.automation.dll, wherever it is in the box, v2's version or v5's version, I will catch that with an ID7 with Sysmon. So if you are interested in Sysmon, you do want to collect the sevens, they will generate a lot of log traffic, but you could set up an alert just for anything that's not PowerShell EXE loading those DLLs. It will not trigger unless something bad is happening. Okay? So Sysmon gives you a lot of power. The Windows logging service would be a similar thing. It's an agent that replaces a Splunk forwarder, or, but a government wrote it. Really cool, basically a, a syslog agent that you can run, and it does lots of that stuff similar to, I call it Sysmon and steroids. So there are other solutions that do this high-end security. Um, there's another one, it's kind of a kernel hack. Think of it as EDR, it's called Secure, ah, crap, can't think of it. We, we talked, we covered it on the podcast, the last podcast with Humio. Uh, one of their clients uses it, uh, uh, Service Guard. Service Guard does a similar thing and logs all this. I just actually saw the, the customer just gave me a walkthrough of what they do. Same scenario, he has triggers based on EXEs calling those DLLs that are not PowerShell to catch the bad poop. So there are some additional ways, or whatever tools you have, if you can see DLL loads, which Windows does nothing for, okay, you have to add something to it to do it, uh, you can catch these, these specialized backdoors that people like Ben 10. Because people say, oh, I watch for PowerShell EXE or PowerShell underscore IS EXE, and now PWSH.exe, and Ben 10 will laugh at you and say, are you looking for not PowerShell? This is what he's talking about. So how do I hunt for PowerShell? Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, log management, right? It's pivotal here because this is where you can regex, this is where you can count, this is where you can strip and, and show all these things that I just showed you. Um, but of course, what, how many people here do not have all this kind of fancy log management? I assume there's going to be a fair set of hands in a room that will agree. In San Antonio, a lot of government people, they won't raise their hands. Uh, but a lot of us don't have fancy ass uh, log management. Um, or we have log management, but we want something that helps us do these things more intelligently. So here is a snap peek at a, a quick cheap peek at LogMD version 2.1. Whoops. And what we did is we took all the PowerShell. We have a report called PowerShell, report underscore PowerShell at text, because the big blurbs make it text, not CSV. And we said, let's take all the logic of all the stuff we know that occurs, of all the bad things we do, and let's make a column that says when we trigger that item, we're just going to label it. And we have a settings file that you can go adjust it. Well, five ticks is too few. Let's make it 10 ticks because my bamboo keeps triggering that. Now, let's make pluses. Let's make it 12, 12 pluses or 25 parents or 30 backslashes. And you can adjust the numbers 
so that you'll get down to zero, and then when you get obfuscation occurring, you should pay attention to it. And we also dedupe it at the same time. So suddenly now, you can see the event IDs on the left. I don't have six of every 400, six of every 500, six of every 800. I only have the ones that are important because I'm, I'm telling you what's in the, the multiple items in one column. You want to do this with your log management as well, but uh, we hard-coded it and made it. And then we tell you what's violated. Your 138 ticks, 264 pluses, that was that big blurb I showed you that had the arrows pointing to. So suddenly now I can run this across my entire environment. It's command line. So now I can go hunting in the environment and say, once I figure out what's normal, and I've run this and done my testing and tweaked my settings file, I can push this out with SSCM, uh, PowerShell, Big Fix, Tanium, whatever you're using, run this, and it should be blank. You should get this down to zero. If it triggers something, investigate it. Suck the report back because it has data in it. And then we give you the first 150 characters or so of the actual payload because I can generally see if it's bad in the first 150 characters. And so that's a sneak peek of what we're doing and how we're trying to help it make it easier to detect uh, PowerShell pwnage uh, with LogMD. So in summary, uh, again, it will, LogMD is free. Download it to check your system and audit your system. You've got to upgrade to PowerShell 5. I beg of you. This is, this is worse than Java, Adobe, not patching Microsoft, okay? Because this is power to the, to the red team, power to the, to the pen testers, power to the hackers. That's on your box. They could give a rat's ass whether you're patched, got Adobe or Java on the box, okay? They're going to get a user to click on something. They're immediately going to go to PowerShell. And so the user's the bad link. It doesn't matter of the others. This is a huge risk to our, to our environment now. And again, use the cheat sheets. You know, all right? Turn it on. Figure out what it is you're doing. Well, what do I turn on? Use the cheat sheets. You've already figured out how to audit it. Uh, create reports and alerts in your log management, SIM, whatever, to look for these conditions after you figure out how to do it in your in your McAfee Nitro or Splunk or Elk Stack or whatever you want to use. I don't care. Um, the Splunk cheat sheet and Humio cheat sheets both have examples of regexing this out. I did give examples in those cheat sheets so that people can cheat and use those queries and tweak them. I have received a couple of tweaks from those queries or from the Splunk queries for sure. Much bigger audience. Um, and it helps you get started. It helps you get an idea of how to do this in log management. And of course, send us your improvements. If you come up with something clever that you think we're missing, please share so that we can include it, and, uh, and, and if we like it and we think you're onto something, uh, by all means, you may want to be anonymous. You know, you're, you may be a Fred and want to be anonymous and don't want to say that out in public, um, uh, but we'll do it and tweet it out saying, hey, thanks for the credit. We, you know, somebody came up with this. And then, but most, mostly, start turning this stuff on, even if you're just collecting it locally, and use PowerShell or LogMD, I don't care what you're using, to go query for this information in some automated daily, weekly, or monthly way. So you can catch these bad guys because that's how they're going to own you now. It is, it is incredibly powerful what you can do with PowerShell. Here's where you can get the stuff. The website, LogMD, the, the uh, Prezo will be on our archaeology under resources. It already is. Look for the ShowMeCon. I was just here in ShowMeCon last week with this Prezo. And so at, it's, it's this Prezo. Just look for the ShowMeCon um, item. And go get the cheat sheets and uh, log away with that. I want to give some serious kudos to this Invincia blog. What buzzwords, do you, I always get this question. So before you can ask the question, I'm going to tell you, what buzzwords should I go looking for? I understand they're going to be obfuscated or potentially can be obfuscated. So how do I then, after I deobfuscate them, what buzzwords do I look for before and after deobfuscation? They went out and analyzed like 2,000 samples of malware that used PowerShell and gave statistics on all the ways these things were, were shortcutted, obfuscated, did some examples to say, hey, this is how you can do this. Uh, really good because in the end, if you read that blog post, you'll have your short list of items to put into LogMD settings to go hunting for. Um, so really, kudos. They did a really good job uh, of what actually is occurring. Daniel will say, but I could do that, but they're not, Daniel. And 99% of the cases are doing it this way. I know you can do it that way, but they're not. And you've got to solve for the 80%. Okay? You just won't get to the 20% unless you solve the 80% first. So please do this first. And then worry about the Daniel type. But I can get around it with that and, and figure out if maybe we're catching him. Uh, here's a bunch of stuff. Daniel's links to the obfuscation. And then, of course, uh, one of the things that Carlos Perez, former colleague of mine at HP, he wrote a metal exploit module that goes out and looks for the logging that I tell you to turn on so he can determine whether or not he can do this without getting caught. Oh, shoot, they're doing all the cheat sheet stuff. I can't do those because he'll catch me. Now he has to do a different attack. 
okay? Which means if you audit the keys that are in the cheat sheets that he's doing in the Metasploit module and he reads them, you're gonna catch him. Just saying. I love you, Carlos, but I can catch you. Here's where you can find us. And uh, again, my blog and, and the cheat sheets are there. And please listen to our podcast. Um, uh, we have fun with it. I've got some nice little noise bits that I, I tend to make me laugh anyway. Um, and with that, we'll take questions. Shoot. I know it's the end of the day. I'm only the person holding you back from beer, but come on. Yes. Is that Carlos Perez? Carlos Perez, dark operator. P-R-E-Z. P-R-E-Z. He now works for um, Binary Defense with Dave Kennedy. Tell him I said hi. <laughs> I think I just did. Hi, Carlos. Yes. Do you have to be an admin? No. Should they be doing that? Should they be doing that? Um, <clears throat> You don't have to. PowerShell will run, will run as a user contact, so it's depending on what you're accessing. So it's the same limitations you have as you know, Command Shell. Um, you can, like, again, anything user space, all the HK user key and all that stuff, they can do. They can run PowerShell, they can do queries. They'll only get rejected if they're doing admin stuff. They'll, they'll escalate privilege for sure. The bad guys, if they get that deep, they will escalate and become admins. But you don't have to. There's a lot of PowerShell you can do with the, not an admin. Any other questions? I will with you drinking beer, so you can always come hit me up there too. Yeah. Uh, related to the concept of like putting that string uh, inside of the script so you can pull it out and send it over to zip, like what's the risk around like that guy putting a malicious, uh, malicious code within that script that he goes over to the ground? Yeah, so uh, the question there is couldn't I just modify an existing script? The answer is yes, this is what they do with WMI. So you do, in theory, what you could do there, if you have identified a series of scripts on your box, you can hash them and then compare the hashes. And if they modified it, which is what we will do with WMD and WMI, because uh, there is some built-in scripts in WMI uh, that use C script, uh, the current BBS script, right? And they'll just add their foo to that. And so when it triggers normally, you know, they haven't actually updated the database, they tweak the script, so the hashing would catch them. So great question. Anything else before you go drink beer and I guess our burgers? Buy raffle tickets. Yes, please buy raffle tickets. If you want prices, spend some money. Where? At the, at the, uh, at the registration desk? Front desk. Buy your raffle tickets. Twelve for a dollar. No, I, 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 I was just going to make mention of the correction earlier.